Thank you for the introduction, Stacy. So um, my name is Dr. Cece Shi, and I'm a pain medicine fellow at Stanford. And topic today is neurocorrelates of trauma and chronic pain. Uh, so I want to talk about this topic because uh, trauma is actually more common than we think it is, and it can be an invisible factor in our the way our brain perceives pain. And understanding this can really help in um, our management and experience of pain. So what is trauma? So trauma, um, you know, is commonly known as either a physical injury or it can also be a very deeply distressing or disturbing experience. And there are actually many different types of trauma. So one that most people are familiar with is a single incident like an accident or a natural disaster. Um, there's also complex trauma. This is a uh, repeated or prolonged exposure to traumatic events such as emotional abuse or physical abuse. And um, added together, this can have a cumulative effect on your well being. There is also vicarious trauma. This is um, often referred to as secondary trauma, where um, just from hearing about or witnessing trauma that is experienced by other people, we can also experience that trauma ourselves. And then there is uh, collective trauma, which is the shared psychological and emotional experience. Um, experienced by a cultural group, a community, or a generation. So I also want to talk about how there's big trauma and small trauma and how they can actually kind of uh, be similar. So we're very familiar with uh, big trauma, which is events that are very life-threatening. And these can include natural disaster, war, um, car accidents, um, plane accidents, but then there's small trauma that tends to be overlooked. Um, these are very distressing events, and um, sometimes they can, you know, they can appear but not. For example, planning a wedding can be really stressful and can be um, so distressing that is traumatic to our body. Um, infidelity or divorce, conflict with family members. Uh, starting a new job, having a child, all of which are um, adverse life experiences and um, can be small traumas. And um, going on to the next slide, these small traumas added up together can be just as distressing as bigger traumas. And the accumulation of these traumas is sometimes known as chronic or complex trauma. So have you experienced trauma, whether small or big in your life? Well, it's very likely, actually, um, here are some statistics. So about 60% of adults report experiencing abuse or other difficult family circumstances when they're a kid. 26% of the kids in the US will witness or experience a traumatic event before they turn the age of four. 76% of adults uh, will be exposed to trauma at some point in their life and 50% of women and 33% of men have experienced physical or sexual violence. But some of this data is from years ago and there could have been increased uh, number of trauma since then. And this doesn't include repressed memories of trauma. So trauma may be a lot more common um, than we realize. So next we're gonna look at how trauma can make our brain uh, vulnerable to pain. So there are three major players in our brain. We have the uh, prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. So the prefrontal cortex is responsible for rational thinking. It regulates emotions, um, such as the emotions from fear response from trauma. And when we have repeated trauma or PTSD, that part of our brain actually shrinks and decreases our ability to actually rationally think or regulate our emotions with trauma. Next, we have the amygdala. This is wired for survival. This is where the, um, the fight or flight response happens. And when this is active, it's really hard to think rationally. And when you have repeated experience of trauma or PTSD, this part of our brain actually becomes more hyperactive. And finally, we have the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory and differentiating between the past and the present. And so when we have consistent exposure to trauma, this area of our brain decreases. 
And um, so the way this can influence us is that it can have a, give us a hard time to differentiate whether the trauma we experienced in the past is still happening to us or not. So next we're gonna look at some evidence from um, MRI studies of the brain to kind of show how uh, we found that trauma and pain can have some overlap in associations. So the first study um, is called the Neurocorreless Linking Trauma and Physical Symptoms. So what they did is that they looked at um, two different groups, one group of people with trauma and one group of people without trauma. And they had them look at stressful images and also relaxing images. And then they monitor their stress and physical symptoms uh, for 30 days. And what they saw was the trauma group actually uh, experienced a lot more physical symptoms. They also had a decreased response in the prefrontal cortex and an increased response in the hippocampus. And just to review again, so the, uh, the prefrontal cortex, that's the uh, part of our brain that's responsible for rational thinking. And again, the hippocampus is responsible for memory and differentiating from the past and the present um, and trying to make sense of the trauma. So this study kind of showed that trauma compromises our brain function increase and can increase our vulnerability to stress and pain related disorders. So uh, the next study called the Neurocorrelates of Pain Related Fear, a meta-analysis comparing fear conditioning studies using painful and non-painful stimuli. So basically this is um, a huge study, a, a meta-analysis that looked at all kinds of studies uh, they compiled all the brain imaging studies that looked at fears, uh, specifically uh, categorized um, them into pain-related fears and non-pain-related fears. And they compared all the imaging between these different studies. And what they found was there was a lot of overlap in the parts of the brain that lit up uh, in pain-related fears and non-pain-related fears, which means that there are similar areas of the brain that gets active, whether or not the fear is pain related or not. So the next study um, is called the Neurocorrelates of Altered Pain Response in Women with PTSD from Intimate Partner Violence. Basically, they looked at um, women who have experienced domestic violence and looked at any difference in brain functioning between women with trauma and women without. So again, they looked at two groups, uh, one group of women with trauma, one group of women without. And what they did was they um, applied thermal heat stimuli, which can create pain and repeatedly applied to their arm. And what they found that in the trauma group, their initial res brain response to the painful stimulation was increased compared to the non-trauma group. But what's interesting is that with repeated stimulation and each of the following stimulation, their brain response actually decreased and their pain intensity rating also decreased. And this response is actually abnormal, but actually expected because it's related to avoidance symptoms that we see in PTSD, as well as dampening of the emotional experience of pain. So in this study concluded that the trauma group showed dysregulated brain activity during pain processing. And this is possibly related to maladaptive coping mechanisms such as avoidance and numbing. So all these studies together show that there's a lot of overlap between trauma and pain response. And they kind of feed into each other um, Having trauma will have an impact on our brain function, causing dysregulation and make us more vulnerable and less resilient to dealing with pain. So this diagram is a very busy diagram, but it kind of shows how, um, you know, stress and pain kind of and trauma work together in the brain and the body and how it influences each other. So um, trauma, which is a type of stress, uh, can, inf uh, can have an impact on our prefrontal cortex. Again, that's the part of the brain that is responsible for rational thinking. So that's um, circled in number four on the diagram. And what happens is when we're under stress, um, whether it's from trauma or stress in life, 
the what happens is the blood flow shifts from our prefrontal cortex to a different part of the brain um, that's responsible for our fight or flight response. So when there's increased blood flow to the part of our brain that um, is responsible for fight or flight, then it causes a whole host of um, symptoms in our body. Um, symptoms can include rapid heart rate, tingling, numbness, just general pain all anywhere in the body, headaches, migraines. And when this happens day after day, month after month, uh, and this cycle continues to repeat, this can actually condition our brain and our nervous system to learn to feel these sensations and actually cause us to feel continuous pain, even though there may be no actual tissue damage or real source of pain. This diagram is just another example of how um, we've found a lot of evidence to show that environmental factors can influence our vulnerability to pain, including trauma, stress, childhood adversity, et cetera. So um, this brings us to talking about why it's important to approach pain um, from a biopsychosocial model, which is what we practice here at Stanford. So what is the biopsychosocial model? Basically, we look at um, additional factors, not just biological factors, we look at psychological and social factors that can influence our perception of pain and addressing all of that together can make our pain management a lot more effective. And here is um, another model of the biopsychosocial model of pain. This one actually includes uh, cultural and spiritual factors. So as you can see, there's a lot of factors um, in our life, in our environment, uh, in our cultural groups that we may not be aware of, that may be invisible to us, um, that actually have just as much of an impact in addition to the biological factors in um, the way our brain and our body um, perceives or react to pain. And understanding all of this can help us actually uh, create a more comprehensive pain treatment. And this infographic actually shows how um, the biopsychosocial model can um, have um, improvements in um, the way we, in the results with managing pain in comparison with conventional medical treatment. You'll see increase in activity, um, increased ability to return to work, increase in pain reduction, as well as increased medical cost savings. So in conclusion, uh, there are invisible factors that can influence how your brain processes your experience of pain, one of which is trauma. And um, this is actually a really great book. Uh, it's called The Body Keeps, uh, Body Keeps the Score, and it talks about how our um, how trauma gets stored in our body and how we can address it and how we can learn to heal from it. And um, this is a book that, you know, you can find on Amazon. Uh, I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in learning more about um, trauma that, um, that maybe that they may not be aware of or trauma they are aware of and want to address. And here are some additional resources um, that we offer here at the Stanford uh, Pain Clinic. And um, we are one of which we offer our virtual pain psychology classes. So we offer a free um, virtual power relief class. Some of you may have taken it. Um, we also offer a free virtual eight week CBT um, uh, cl group class on pain coping skills. Um, we also offer virtual education, uh, including these uh, pain science lectures at the first Monday of each month. And there's some other additional resources on this page. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you all for um, being here tonight and listening to this lecture. I hope you learned something. And I hope this prompts you to when uh, talk about trauma as a potential factor in your experience in pain with your pain doctor at your next visit. Mm -hmm.